Hey, very warm welcome to Reflections. This is our devotional Bible study we have. Uh, we're presently looking at some of the stories of Jesus, better known as parables. Uh, these are earthly stories with a heavenly meaning or twist Jesus gives to uh, encourage us to follow him. If you have a Bible, I'd like to turn to Luke chapter 14. We'll get there in a minute. Our question we're answering today is, what's the cost to follow Jesus? Can't think of a better hymn to begin with today than Onward, Christian Soldiers. <laughs> Onward, Christian Soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus. truths in that hymn, is there not? The uh, gates of hell will never prevail against the church, the people of God, because of uh, the promises of Christ. Uh, this is a triumph song. Uh, we continue to join the angels and all the hosts of heaven, uh, giving glory and honor to Jesus Christ. Well, Luke chapter 14, beginning with verse 25, the cost of being a disciple or follower of Jesus Christ. That's the question, what's the cost to follow Jesus? Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brother and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king, Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other still is a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? 
It is fit neither for the soul nor for the manure pile. It's thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. There was a Russian comedian, Yakov Smirnov. He was amazed at the variety of instant products in the United States. Powdered milk. You add water and you have milk. What a country. He said, powdered orange juice. You add water and you get orange juice. What a country. Then he saw baby power, powder. He said, oh, what a great country. Yeah, if you want a baby, just add, add water. That, that's why he's a comedian. Well, one thing is for certain, there is no such thing as an instant follower of Christ. There's no such thing as an instant child. Same way with the disciple. No, Jesus tells us there's a big difference between a disciple and a believer. Remember, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and, and, and turning to them, which was a very dramatic act. Turning has the idea of twisting forcefully with deliberate effort. Say Jesus spun around this morning and pointed at you and said, why are you following me? Well, some in Jesus' day just wanted to see a miracle or get another free meal. Now, we like to check things out ourselves, don't we? Every time you notice a, an auto accident on a, a highway, it slows down traffic on both sides. Well, people tend to slow down to see what happened. Well, that was the crowd in Jesus' day. Like the crowd, people at times want to see what happens next. And the crowd is about to become smaller. Jesus describes what a real disciple is all about. There was a hog and hen who heard about a church's program to feed the hungry. And so they discussed how they could help. The hen said, oh, let's provide bacon and eggs to feed the hungry. The hog replied, one thing wrong with your bacon and eggs idea for you it only requires a contribution, but for me, it will mean total commitment and sacrifice. Jesus also requires total commitment. What's it cost to follow Jesus? Well, what we read, he shares several marks of discipleship or a signposts of what it means to be a disciple. He begins with family. If anyone comes to me and does not Hate, wow, that's strong, isn't it? Hate, father and mother, wife and children, hate, brother and sisters, hate even your own life, cannot be my disciple. Well, imagine how offensive that was to the listeners of Jesus' day. See, there was a, that culture honored family. It was a, a very high obligation. <laughs> One a pastor entitled his message on this very passage, How to Hate Your Wife. Well, again, Jesus often used figures of speech to give his words a greater impact. He simply employed hyperbole, an intentional exaggeration <clears throat> to emphasize a point. You know, I think wives use hyperbole, something like a uh, I've told you a million times to put the seat down. Point well made. Well, the word hate here means to prefer above. So if anyone comes to Jesus and does not uh, prefer him over other relationships, even his own life, cannot be my disciple. See, to be a, a disciple or our love for Christ stands above <clears throat> even family. Diane Curry and Heather Mercer were held prisoner by Taliban for 128 days in Afghanistan. Both were committed Christians. Dateline interviewed Heather's mother who opposed her decision, and the media tried to play up the story to show Heather's commitment to Christ divided her family. Her book, Prisoners of Hope, she wrote, and I quote, we answered, 
hard questions posted by our families. Extraordinary are the parents who don't balk at the idea of their child moving to a third world, war ravaged, drought stricken country. And in this case, a country serving as a hub for international terrorist activity that we had decided to go as Christian aid workers to a country where a harsh, unpredictable regime severely curtailed religious freedom gave most of our loved ones pause at best and otherwise prompted serious alarm. We were asked, aren't you being foolish? Why would you jeopardize your own safety? Well, Jesus' love for him to make a difference, to share the gospel, was more important even above their own personal lives. <clears throat> then Jesus went on to say, if, <clears throat> and anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, a cross for many is associated with putting up with an obnoxious relative, an illness or an affliction. People say, well, I have lower back pain. I guess it's the cross I must bear. You know, a junior executive had been complaining to his wife of aches and pains. Neither one could account for his trouble. Arriving home from work one night, he informed her, honey, I discovered why I'm feeling so miserable. We got ultra modern office furniture two weeks ago. I just learned today. I've been sitting in the wastebasket. <clears throat> you know, today the image of the cross has lost its shock, and for many it's just a piece of harmless jewelry. You see, the true message of the cross is death. And in Jesus' time, an agonizing, torturous mode of execution. When you saw someone carrying a cross, it meant only one thing, death. Now that's a good description of the disciple of Christ. What are we to put to death? It's called the flesh, the self-directed life. Death to self. You know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor during World War II. He opposed Hitler and the Nazis and was imprisoned where he died before the war ended. He wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. He said, the cross is laid on every Christian. Embark upon discipleship. We surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. The cross does not the terrible end to otherwise God-fearing and happy life. When Christ calls someone, he bids them come and die. See, we're not truly free until we understand what it is to be crucified with Christ. That's death to self, death to our independence, death to our agendas, death to our expectations. You know, one of the challenges as a young pastor was, you know, when I graduated from Concordia St. Louis Seminary in 1985, you know, my, I think my ultimate prayer was, oh God, it would be wonderful to uh, be in the mountains well, our first call was to the mountains of Meeker, Colorado, or, and then Rangeley, which is more uh, ranching, uh, oil, <clears throat> a desert kind of world. But the, the, they were two places 60 miles apart. But there in that midst, the, the point says, Lord, you know, to serve you, we, we just we need to learn to bloom where you plant us. And so with that change of mind and rather going where I want to serve God, it was, Lord, you open the door, I'll serve you wherever you lead our family. And so we've had some amazing opportunities to serve him, but it, it, it was kind of a death to, well, where do I want to serve? Where do we want to serve? But Lord, where would you plant us to serve you? It's death to self, our agendas, our independence, our own expectations. A pastor said, uh, wrote sarcastically, I'd like to buy $3 worth of God, please. 
Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep. Just enough to equal a cup of warm water or snooze in the sunshine. Not enough to make me love everyone or pick beats with the migrant. I want ecstasy, not transformation. The warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want about a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I'd like to buy three dollars worth of God, please. See, many want the blessings of God without being transformed by him. Christ bids us to come and die. What, what is he working on in your life that he wants to put a, a death to? Death of worry, death of uh, you fill in the blank. Then uh, <clears throat> Jesus illustrates, uh, suppose somebody wants to uh, build a tower. Well, they estimate the cost to see if they have enough money to complete it. Because if they lay the foundation and can't finish it, people will make fun because uh, they began to build but were not able to finish the project. See, there's no such thing as coasting or spiritual retirement in the kingdom of God. God calls us to finish well. See, not everyone in the Bible finish, finished well. Noah, Samson, Solomon are a few examples. You know, Billy Sunday played professional baseball from 1883 to 1890 for Chicago, Pittsburgh, and Philly. He held the uh, National League record for running bases in the day of 14 seconds. One of the most famous preachers of his day, he laid the groundwork for the Billy Graham Crusades. He said, stopping at third adds no more to the score than striking out. It doesn't matter how well you start if you fail to finish strong when we are in trouble. Paul said to the Philippians, being confident of this, that he began a good work in you will carry it to completion. Well, the good news is none of us are finished yet on this side of heaven. The finish line is still ahead. The best is coming, a glorified body. But God calls us to uh, finish well. Now, hard to believe this year turned 65, uh, 38 years in uh, public ministry. Uh, it boggles the imagination where the time goes. In two years, it'll be uh, 40 years in ministry. So I was kind of teasing our executive director, Lynn, said, well, I'm, gonna, I'm giving you my 12-year notice now just so there's no surprises. She kind of chuckled and so did the staff. But it meant that, you know, my heart is to keep serving Jesus Christ. Uh, when I'm 77, that would be 50 years in ministry. Now, I don't know what the future holds. I know who holds the future. But Lord, whatever it is, each of us, Lord, we just want to finish strong the Christian race that you've given us. Doesn't matter what our station in life is. Doesn't matter what's going on. Lord, by your grace, help us finish this Christian race because we know the best is coming. You know, a reporter asked a 104-year-old woman, what is the best thing about her age? She said, no peer pressure. That's what I call a finish strong attitude. And most centenarians, when they ask them, what's the secret for living 100 years or longer? They said, two things, learn how to handle change and a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no greater joy the knowing that Jesus went to the cross, shed his blood, rose victorious, conquering sin, death, and the grave for you and me. And to every repentant heart, by his grace, through faith in Christ, we can live each day as a loved and forgiven child of God. That is the most wonderful truth. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. <laughs> Then Jesus goes on to describe a king about to go at war with another king. And, well, he's considering, can my 10,000 men go against the one with 20,000? Uh, I don't think I'm going to risk it. So he'd send a delegation and ask for terms of peace. And Jesus said, in the same way, any of you who does not give up everything cannot be my disciple. See, you and I are one of the kings and God is the other. Um, 
because we can never win against God. We must surrender to him. And that requires great humility to ask for terms of peace. It takes great humility to surrender all to Jesus. You know, on February 3, 1943, a troop ship, the Dorchester, was carrying more than 900 soldiers. A German U-boat spotted the convoy and fired three torpedoes at the ship. Only one struck the target, but the blast below the waterline fatally damaged the ship. In the cold darkness, the crew was ordered to abandon ship. There were not enough light boats for all the men, nor were there enough life jackets. Four chaplains helped comfort those injured in the explosion and those who feared death. When the ship was all ready to sink, the chaplains gave their life jackets to those who had none. They gave up their own lives in order to save others. That heroic gesture inspired a nation. Congress voted a special medal in their honor. Now, most of us are not called to physically lay down our lives, but many need our help. People all around us who don't know the Lord need us to share the good news and message of salvation, the gospel, with them. You know, a chaplain ministering to a soldier in the hospital said, you've lost an arm in the great cause. The soldier said, I didn't lose it, I gave it. See, Jesus did not lose his life, he willingly gave it. For the joy set before him endured the cross. <clears throat> For the joy set before us, we endure. You know, the Bible says outwardly, Yes, we're aging, we're getting older, but inwardly, the Holy Spirit, the grace of God is renewing us with the peace and the joy and the strength to follow Jesus. As the song said, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender, I surrender all. Then Jesus closed us with a, an illustration. He said, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, it can't be made salty again. It's, it's not fit for the soil or manure pile. It's thrown out. Now, salt was very valuable. The pay Roman soldiers, preservative, fertilizer, heal wounds, very valuable. In the religious life of the Jew, salt signified God's holiness and the holiness of his people. So Christians, we're preserving elements within society. You know, salt came from the Dead Sea. When the water evaporated, it left salt. But sometimes the salt would mix with other minerals. It looked, tasted, and poured like salt, but it wasn't salty and no longer useful. The saltless disciple loses the ability to make a difference for Jesus. Thank God the blood of Jesus washes us white as snow, and so we are sanctified, set apart for service. You know, one pastor said, I'm only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do, and what I ought to do by the grace of God, I will do. You know, I'm amazed at the many people in our Bluffs community who are, are willing hearts to serve and make a difference for Christ. I'm grateful for the, the servants who on Sunday morning come and take of their time and wheel uh, care center residents down so they can worship Jesus on a Sunday morning. Makes all the difference. Without those servant hearts, we wouldn't be able to um, be there in the Sunday service. And there's no greater joy than being in church on Sunday, is there? A big difference from viewing it on a screen. You know, there was a young boy who sat in church and watched as the offering plate was being passed. He reached inside his pocket for something to put in. To his dismay, he had nothing inside. As the plate was passed down his row, he put the plate on the ground and stepped inside. He had no money to give, but he gave the most important thing he had, himself. These 
are the powerful words of Jesus. Followers of Jesus put family or put Jesus above family. Followers of Jesus are continually dying to their ways. They have a desire to finish strong, to surrender all, and know they're set apart to make a difference, to serve Jesus no matter what their age, no matter what's going on. We're all just simply wanting to make a difference to an, another resident, a staff member, uh, our own family members. Well, as we've heard God's word, let's sing that great hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Now, we might not literally stand up, but we're standing up in our hearts as we sing this great hymn. <clears throat> stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the Stand in his strength alone Beyond a flesh will fail you Ye dare not trust your own Put on the gospel armor Each beast put on with bread Where fifty calls or danger Be never wanting there Stand up and up for Jesus the strife will not be long This day the din of battle The next the victor's song The soldiers overcoming Their crown of life shall see And with the King of glory Shall reign And with the King of glory, one day we will also reign eternally with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So keep running the race. It might not always be easy, but it's a marathon, not a sprint. We have the grace of God, the, the, the Holy Spirit empowering us to uh, keep on making a difference, assuring us we are a loved and forgiven child of God. So may that grace, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be multiplied unto you until we uh, meet again.